Welcome to Snooze with Sam. Scottish ambient sleep stories, meditations, and writing pseudo-novels that I hope one day might be published by Bloomsbury. So here it is, finally. Thank you so much for your patience and your incredible support, as always. Now every now and again I like to create something special, or what I would consider special. These are the types of stories that consume me for weeks on end and have my heart and soul poured into them, and this one is no different. I wanted to create something that could have been written by J.K. Rowling herself, perhaps as a prequel or extension of the Harry Potter series. I wanted to take the world of Harry Potter and run with it. But not only that, I wanted to immerse you to a whole new level, to create a movie for the mind or a picture in words. But don't worry if you're not a Harry Potter fan or are unfamiliar, you will still Love the journey of imagery and ambience, I can assure you that. The story will have you encapsulated. So, when you are quite ready, lie back, take a nice deep breath. And enjoy the Philosopher's Stone, an untold story. Chapter 1 Paris. My dear child, it is beyond imperative that this is kept a secret. No one can know, not even your closest of kin. The old man shuffled to and fro across the lounge floor agitated, not knowing which way to head or where to place himself. His feet itched, his frail hands shook, and his mind clearly spun. Be calm, Nicholas. You must settle, please. You need not worry, you assured him. A returning glance, wearing a raised, bushy eyebrow, expressed enough about his scepticism. I am not so confident, my dear. Neither am I about your understanding of the severity of the potential consequences, should the stone fall into the wrong hands. This much you did understand, but you remained quiet, allowing your colleague and friend to release his tension, to express himself. 
you didn't want to stoke his nerves. Enough of the wrong people know of its existence as it is. However, after receiving news of the dark wizard Grindelwald's uprising, I fear for what may come, should its attainment become his priority. Nicholas mooched wearily in the direction of the front-facing paned window of his Parisian apartment, gazing out across a bustling 1920s Paris. You could see his eyes working wildly, searching for solutions amongst what felt like a torrent of impending problems. It was a very flat grey day in Paris. The Eiffel Tower stood stoutly guarding and overwatching. Drizzly rain pitter pattered on the window panes. Water droplets crept south, some jumping, some seemingly still. Dim headlights of coach-built Citroëns, Renaults and Model T Fords crawled along cobblestones, meandering through trench coats, top hats and ankle-length dresses. Silence fell over the room. The faint ticking of an ancient old grandfather clock timing the tension. With a great sigh, the old man turned slowly, looking defeated, and shuffled over to a large battered desk beside a great golden floor lamp trimmed with bronze and purple feathers which looked as though they'd once belonged to some fantastic beast. On top of this desk were a variety of other weird and wonderful paraphernalia, of which only an alchemist and wizard as prolific as he would possess. A crystal ball set into an outrageously trimmed obsidian mount. A rack of test tubes, all containing continuously moving fluids which never seemed to settle. Trays and sealed petri dishes of colourful powders. Collections of dusty books, big and small. Potion scrolls, scribbled experiments noted on parchment. Some with their edges singed. 
It was a feast for the eyes and imagination. All a representation of this man's brilliance. Sliding open the middle drawer of this desk, he pulled out a small black cloth, perhaps made of silk. Inside the silk nested something unidentified. But you were sure you knew what it was, and what was contained within. Nicholas turned to you, a sympathetic smile, desperately trying to escape. My dear, I have something to ask of you, a favour, a great favour. Taking your hand, he opened your palm and placed in it the silk parcel, beckoning you to open it. You did so, as prompted, carefully peeling back the folds, treating this thing with every ounce of care, as though wrapped up in the blanket was a newborn child. The final lifted piece revealed a deep, glassy rock, ruby in colour, about the size of a small apple. The Philosopher's Stone, you whispered through marvelling lips. Nicholas nodded in appreciation, though you suspect he was sharing your marvel, even still, all of these years later. The stone cannot stay here, my child. I am asking you to take it somewhere safe. The stone must be lost. I would take it myself, but as you are well aware, I would struggle in my frailty and would likely not succeed in taking it to safety. I would not ask you otherwise. But you are a great friend, a wonderful soul, and I trust you like one of my own. This is why I am asking you. You nodded a gentle understanding. He was right. Where must I take it, Nicholas? You asked. To Hogwarts, the school of witchcraft and wizardry. There, I wish you to meet 
a young wizard named Albus Dumbledore. He is a professor there, a scholar of the dark arts. He will help you keep the stones safe. The old man also handed you a stamped and sealed letter and told you not to open it until you reached King's Cross Station. Placing the letter and the Philosopher's Stone inside your inner jacket pocket, you made for the door. One last thing, my dear, Nicholas said. Bon chance, et sois prudent. Merci, Nicolas. You smile. With that, you opened the door, stone safely stored in your pocket, and left for Hogwarts. Chapter 2 King's Cross King's Cross Station was a wonderful feast for every sense. It never stopped moving. A constant delivery line of coming and going travellers, all destined for some place else. High above your head Huge, arcing steel rafters kept aloft large panes of antique glass, reminiscent of your grandmother's greenhouse. The time was 9.55 in the morning. Everywhere you looked, merchants, buskers and beggars all jostled and performed for the coins of those passing. Crowds hummed, trains whooshed and hooted. Conductors whistled and cried. You merely tried your best to avoid being drawn into the whirlpool of scarcely organised chaos. You sidestepped businessmen engrossed in the day's paper, often being held at face level as they walked as the crows flew.
how they could see where they were going, you had no idea. Perhaps if you lived in London long enough, you grew a sort of commuting radar, or a shameless disregard. Either way, their execution in cow ploughing their way through the crowds was admirably effective. Your thoughts found themselves back in Paris, the Philosopher's Stone, the need for it to be taken to safety. You subconsciously found yourself clutching your jacket pocket in security checking that it was still there, still safe. And Nicholas, the infamous Nicholas Flamel. This elderly, well-to-do French gentleman was no ordinary soul, nor was he any ordinary man. He was a profoundly talented alchemist and powerful wizard. Over the years of working with him, He'd slowly, but surely, shared with you his fascinating life, as well as some of his deepest and darkest secrets. Born in the 14th century, Nicholas had attended Beau Baton Academy of Magic in the Pyrenees Mountains of France. Here he became a noted alchemist of considerable talent and at some point he created the Philosopher's Stone an item of immense magical power. After years of study, trial and error and secretive experimentation, Nicholas managed to create the elixir of life a potion that made the drinker functionally immortal as long as it was regularly ingested. It was clear that he'd used the elixir to greatly extend his life, but he never once gave a clue as to the whereabouts of the potion. The stone, however, was a secret he'd confided in you about a number of years ago. The very stone in your pocket.
elsewhere though and over the centuries. The stone had turned from myth to legend, from legend to reality, and now, now its existence and location were said to be known, not least by the dark wizard, Galert Grindelwald. This is why Nicholas had entrusted you. At this point in time, he was 604 years old. And what of this Albus Dumbledore fellow? He wasn't a name you were altogether familiar with, but it rang a bell somewhere. When conversing with Nicholas, you'd thought best not to pry for any information he did not readily volunteer, was usually well kept. You supposed as much anonymity as possible was preferable in this instance. Safer for everyone involved. Brushing shoulders with a rushing businessman. Briefcase and umbrella clenched in his tense fist. You stirred from your thoughts and became aware of a piano ringing out through the halls. A gentle tinkle at first. You followed the sound, squeezing through gaps in the sea of black coats. The music grew closer and closer until the dancing feet upon sprung piano pedals became visible through the legs of many a spectator. Up on your tiptoes, straining for a view of the musician, You caught momentary glimpses of a colourful robe, a mix of burgundies and mustards, with flashes of electric blue. The most spectacular flourish of colour in an abyss of dark business and formal way. This person was a man, that was for sure, with curly-toed brown shoes and grey pinstripe trousers. His hat was rough around the edges, although it still resembled 
the crisp trilby it used to be. The tune which he played upon the piano keys was beautiful, bewitching, and evocative and had a lovely flowing tempo to it, and he played effortlessly. So much so, that for a few minutes the bustle of King's Cross seemed to just melt away completely. For those few moments, it was just you and the floating musical notes which rung out through the rafters above. Something stirred your soul, and again you suddenly became aware of a weight in your breast pocket, the stone. With a pat, he confirmed it was still in place, and you passed a relieved sigh through pursed lips. Then, the crowd was back, rubbing shoulders with you, as was the incessant roar of people and embarking steam locomotives. Shrugging and blinking yourself present, a few gaps opened up ahead as the crowds dispersed and revealed something bizarre. The place where the piano and musician had been mere moments ago was empty. Bear. They were gone. No more music. No one there at all. A moment of cognitive paralysis came and went as you looked over your shoulder for any signs of empathy from other witnesses. But nothing. Everyone moved around as if they'd seen nothing at all. A little spellbound still trying to process what it was you just witnessed. You stepped away slowly, still staring at the spot on the platform on which you just seen the colourfully dressed piano man. You knew little about Hogwarts School. Again, like many things in your studious career, much of your knowledge had come from books, or tales told from wise, 
experienced individuals, such as your dear friend Nicholas. As far as Hogwarts went, you'd seen painted pictures depicting a tall castle overlooking a great lake, surrounded by vast forests. All very fantasy fairy tale, you'd thought. No one had ever told you where it actually was. Somewhere north of London City, you'd supposed. Given King's Cross Station was the only place in which one could depart from. With that thought, you wished to check the next available departing to Hogwarts School. In the main foyer, set back from all the platforms, a throng of bodies gathered around a constantly changing notice board of departing and arriving trains. In a furious tornado of black and white number and letter cards, two slight-handed and uniformed servicemen juggled them into sense, revealing the critical information. Scanning the whole board, again and again, you couldn't see anything concerning a Hogwarts stop. Nothing at all. Mildly concerned that you may be in the wrong place, you looked around and approached a conductor standing nearby. Excuse me, dear chap, you spoke. Could you tell me where I might catch a train to Hogwarts? I was told that it departs from King's Cross, London. A muddled and humoured look spread across the face of the ruddy fellow, which only antagonised you in your moment of frustration. What was that? Hogwarts? Are you joking me? Ha! Never heard of it, I'm afraid. He laughed, though sympathetically, as he could see from your expression that you were, in fact, not joking. You hadn't even dared mention that it was a school for wizards and witches. Defeated and disgruntled, you retreated to a quiet corner of the station. The clock positioned up above the platforms read 10.25. You'd already been wandering around here for a half hour.
What do I do now? You said to yourself. In an unfamiliar place, surrounded by unfamiliar people, this was the last thing you needed. And then you remembered something. The letter. The letter that Nicholas gave to you in Paris. How on earth could you have forgotten? Hurriedly, you reached inside your breast pocket and bypassed the stone to withdraw the small, wax-sealed envelope. Carefully peeling back the wax so as not to damage the paper, you took out a folded note. Opening it, the note read Platform 9 and 3 quarters 11 a.m. Run and commit. Take care, Nicholas. That was it. Nine and three quarters. Run and commit. What in heaven's name did that mean? By process of logical elimination, you searched around for a sign pointing to platforms 9 and 10, and made in that direction. Upon arrival, a few minutes later, there they both were, platforms 9 and 10, separated by a sandy brick archway running between them. But that was it. Nothing signing platform nine and three quarters. Run and commit. You remembered that this was a wizard you were dealing with. And the inexplicable experience earlier on had already placed your mind in a strange between worlds state of mind. Were you going mad? Staring at the wall between the platforms, you contemplated the ridiculous. Run and commit. Run and commit. And with that, a weary glance over your shoulder and a great, big, deep breath for good measure, you started towards the wall, aiming squarely for the bricks between platforms 9 and 10.
run and commit, Nicholas had said. Your stiff walk then turned into a run. This is totally bonkers, he thought. You are about to run into a wall. Upon approach, you closed your eyes and waited for the inevitable impact. But the impact never came. With a great leap, one which was unnoticed and invisible to the onlookers of King's Cross, you ran at the wall between platforms 9 and 10 and vanished. Chapter 3 The Hogwarts Express This day was turning out to be one of the most bizarre of your life. When you finally opened your eyes, though you were feared to, you found yourself standing on an entirely different platform. This platform was much smaller, with a far cosier bustle about it. Families gathered around each other, exchanging hugs, luggage items, gifts and travel supplies. Lots of the younger folk were all dressed the same, like a school uniform. Big black robes, trimmed in colour. Gold, green, blues and reds. Spinning on the spot, you searched for some form of identification of where you, as a matter of fact, were. Reaching out on the stem from the wall, an attractively painted sign read, Platform nine and three quarters. You were here. Eventually, you've relaxed your tense shoulders, your eyes still a little wide from leaping through a solid brick wall. Finally, your notice landed upon a hissing and steam-clouded train parked up at the end of the platform.
sidling a little closer, you pulled up to the side of a passenger carriage. A logo on the tender read Hogwarts Railways. You were definitely in the right place then. That must make this the Hogwarts Express. You'd read about this too in your studies. Taking a few steps back, you drank it in. It was such a majestic piece of engineering, steeped in mystery and myth. The gorgeous, thick paintwork of coal black and deep crimson red was laced with gold. Every detail of its metalwork was unapologetic about its mass, quality and heft. At the very front, at the head of the water tank, the black and gold placard sat proudly. The Hogwarts Express, the gateway to Hogwarts School. Taking in the scene, you admired the great plumes of steam escaping from various little pipes, valves and taps as the behemoth train sat faithfully at the platform's side, rearing to go. This didn't feel real, not in the least. But dragging your hands over the cold case iron of the piston housings, reality finally set in. The world you'd known of Paris, Muggles, that's non-wizards, and legend, was clashing with a world of witchcraft and wizardry that you knew very little about. Until experienced, How was one to connect with it? You suppose you hadn't truly believed. Not much beyond your experimental alchemy, anyway. A voice bellowed from the head of the train. All aboard the Hogwarts Express, two minutes. The conductor, dressed in a rich maroon uniform, dangled from a handle on the side of the lead carriage. A quick check of your pocket watch confirmed the time to be just after 10.58 in the morning. 
right on time. Not wasting another moment, you shuffled aboard the nearest carriage, moved along a corridor or two before finding yourself a vacant cabin. This was most unlike regular trains. They were normally cramped, filled with lots of people, all fighting for a space to breathe. But this locomotive exuded a comfort, coziness, and luxury which was usually reserved for only the upper classes. And it wasn't busy at all. How novel. How novel indeed. Once settled in your seat, and only a few moments after you began peering around at the local decor, the train began to move. With a couple of distant shunts and bangs, as the engine car took up the slack of the passengers, the platform's edge gently whooshed away from right to left. And out of view sped King's Cross Station and the journey was underway. What had felt like existing in an echo chamber of steampunk percussion quickly fell away to mellow, soothing chugs and huffs as the train left the confines of the station and out into open space. Over the course of a few hours, industrious suburban London, if that's even where you were, bled into sporadic chimney smoke villages. They themselves dispersed even further beyond into rural countryside, lined with quaint dry stone walls and arable farmland. At one point, you even found yourself actually counting sheep as you admired a lone shepherd and his faithful collie round them up as best they could. The longer the journey went on, the further distance there was between farms and livestock. Rolling hills merged into more mountainous glens and wilder foliage. And those tame farm animals were replaced by wild raptors, fowl, and hares. But 
But one thing, and one thing only, stayed constant. And that was the Hogwarts Express itself. Which huffed and puffed, as if born to do it. Now that you thought about it, you supposed that's exactly what it was born to do. Recalling a work of literature on Hogwarts, you read that before the Statute of Secrecy was put into place. And that was a wizarding law put into effect to prevent the persecution of witches and wizards from muggles. Students used methods such as broomsticks, apparition, and magical creatures to travel to Hogwarts. Afterwards, port keys were initially used. A port key was an enchanted object which would transport a person to a pre-specified location, by the way. However, this caused many logistical problems. The solution of the train was finally introduced by the Minister for Magic. The exact origin of the Hogwarts Express was uncertain, but it was rumoured to have involved 167 memory charms and the largest ever mass concealment charm performed in Britain. Some say the train was built by muggles, and due to this muggle origin, many pure blood parents disapproved of the train, but could do little about it, as the ministry forbade any other method of travelling to Hogwarts. And so, there you were, aboard the most mystical of locomotives, hardly able to comprehend what was real, what was magic, or what was imagination. But you suspected a hint of denial, merely struggling to detach fully from your scientific roots. Ponder in awe some more, so you did, as the train Wuffled along happily, destined for Hogwarts School itself. Chapter 4 
trolley. We rattle, stirred you from your sleep, like a tea tray on metal. Then followed the squeak of a caster kneading oil, and a murmuring voice. Through bleary eyes, you rose up from your catnap with a sharp inhale of fresh air. Though you felt as though you'd been asleep for hours, such was your grogginess. Gathering focus and testing your eyes throughout the cabin. Your gaze fell upon a little old lady hovering in the doorway. You got a mild startle from her presence. Maybe it was your semi-woke state, but you swore there was something witchy about her. Not in a dreadful or ugly way, not at all, just in an unusual way, a way which you were not familiar with. Her mannerisms, the way she dressed. Anything from the trolley, my dear, she said sweetly. You were still half asleep, but casting a hasty eye over the trolley, you read the sign. Honeydukes Express. Oh, my apologies, dearest. Good heavens, I must have dropped off for a moment or two. You feigned through blushing cheeks. The trolley lady giggled with a raised eyebrow or two. Perhaps you did, perhaps you did, though you suppose she saw through your optimism. Moving things swiftly on, you blinked hard and set about loosely scanning the trolley. You'd always found yourself a little peckish upon waking up from a nap. What do you recommend for a first time traveller upon this marvellous express? You conversed cheerily. Oh well, where do I start? We've got Chocolate frogs, Bertie Bots, every flavour beans, cauldron cakes, Drupal's best blowing gum, jelly slugs, licorice swans, pumpkin pasties. Your eyes widened. Oh, goodness. That is quite a salute. You cycle drops. Fizzing whizbees popping pixie wing dust, 
roasted chimera potato crisps, shrieking sherbet exploda soda, bubble brew. Thank you, really, thank you, you implored with a nervous smile. Um, do you have any tea? Tea? I'm afraid not, my love. But actually, I'm pretty certain I've got a few peppermint teas in my handbag. Won't be a minute, my darling. But before you could even object to her selflessness, she was gone. Away down the corridor, in a flurry of shoey shuffles. Not wanting to be rude, you glanced over again the vast array of sweets and candies, feeling your teeth ache in sympathetic anticipation. You picked out a cauldron cake, presuming it harmless and the fact it would complement your inbound tea quite nicely. After a brief moment, the wee old witch was back with a little pot, cup, and saucer, and placed it down on your table. Thank you oh so much, you really, really shouldn't have. Here, I'll take this cake too, you said, handing her some money. Don't be silly, my dear. I couldn't be taking any payment from our special guest. The witch chuckled, rearranging her trolley. Special guest? What do you... But before you could even finish your sentence, she was shuffling her way down the carriage, onto the next cabin. Anything from the trolley, my dears? You heard her coo in the distance. Chapter 5 Hogwarts Sipping your tea nibbling on some cauldron cake and watching the world go by. You pondered the words of the trolley witch. Special guest. What could she mean? Did she know something? But how could she? It was probably nothing.
The Hogwarts Express broke free from the confines of the glens and mounted the famous viaduct. A stunning series of archways high above the ground arcing around in one big semicircular cow. Again, you had heard others speak of this gorgeous railway bridge. But to see it with your own eyes was magical. You picked out the details in the brickwork. The majority of it appearing hundreds of years old. Your carriage reached the viaduct and suddenly the ground dropped away from beneath your window. Opening out your view to the river below. You'd be lying if the pit of your stomach didn't lurch a little. But you couldn't argue with the view across the glen. For miles it lay, as far as the eyes could see. A few more mechanical clunks and bangs shuddered through the carriages, followed by an almighty blow on the express's horn. The train was slowing down. You were nearly there, at long last. The chuffs and puffs slowed, sounding lazier. Wisps of steam passing your window every so often. And then, alongside the tracks, buildings near. Quaint little buildings, all beams, rafters, and tall, acute roofs. And then the platform's edge slid into frame. Hogsmeade Station. A dangling sign read in handwritten scripture. And underneath it, the words, Welcome to Hogwarts. Tingles of nerves and anticipation coursed through your body. You were here. You had made it to Hogwarts. The train pulled up to a stop and the whole great behemoth of a locomotive sighed a relaxed sigh. Steam and pressure billowing out all around. Hi. 
gathering your few possessions and clutching your breast pocket, you disembarked. This was it. following everyone else and occasionally for your own security signs for Hogwarts school itself you walked for around 20 minutes through a little high street and then along a lovely gravel path bordered with beautiful summer flower beds. Their aromas and vibrant colours were bewitching in themselves. Though so far, so normal, you thought to yourself. That was until you reached a set of tall iron gates, bordered by a great stone wall. You paused. This looked serious. But everyone else seemed to be going through without hesitation. With a sigh and a shrug, you shook away your nerves and followed. And it was in that moment, as you slipped through the great iron gates, that everything changed. This place was nothing like you'd ever set eyes on in your life. No matter which direction you looked, you were dumbstruck. Dead ahead, in the middle distance, sat a castle so great and so grand plunging high up into the sky as if plucked from a fantasy fairy tale you couldn't even count how many turrets there were or how many levels there were to each wing, so many were there. Set high on a cliff, the school imposed, akin to a Greek god nestled in the clouds. To one side, a vast sports pitch lined with colourful spectator stands, and to the other, the great lake which you'd seen in paintings. Beyond it all, a sprawling woodland reeked of mystical and magical beings just from looking at it. It comprised of twisted willows and giant oaks so characterful you wouldn't be surprised if they all had names 
and talk. Reaching the main courtyards of the school grounds, you are taken aback by its beauty. Everywhere you looked, enchanted candles lit the way and scattered gothic shadows of stone-carved goblins all across the castle facades. Hundreds of witch and wizard students hurried about their business, holstering books, wands and beautiful animals, the likes of ferrets, weasels, rabbits, cats and more. All clung to their owners in life-bound companionship. Above your head, owls and eagles swooped low brushing the heads of students with their wingtips. Scrolls and letters and parcels clutched tightly in talons. It was almost overwhelming. Everything breathed a breath of magic, some tangible, some subtle and barely noticeable. Feeling the stone jab your ribs as you twisted this way and that eyes transfixed on all that surrounded you. Your mind was brought back to the primary objective, Albus Dumbledore. That was the professor's name, wasn't it? Summoning a fragment of confidence. You spotted a young wizard on their brief lonesome, who'd just disengaged from conversation. You took your chance. Excuse me, young sir. But may I ask you the whereabouts of one Albus Dumbledore? I am told he's a professor here. The boy cheerily responded. Oh, why yes, of course. It's quite simple, really. And so the wee wizard proceeded to list such a bewildering array of roots, coordinates and hand gestures, you swore the puppeteer who was controlling this chap was having a seizure. And then once you've passed the bellowing barn owl, Take the corridor on the left, adjacent to the grand staircase, but don't take the wrong turn, otherwise you'll end up in the troll dungeons. Have, have you ever been in a dungeon before? It's quite fascinating. The trolls are so very ugly. They're like overripe fruit fallen from the highest tree. Do you know what else falls from trees? P. 
people when the Whomping Willow has a fit. I wouldn't go near the Whomping Willow if I were you. Very painful. Nobody ever likes to walk away from that. Not even if you do walk away. Things feel... Oh, Chapter 6 The Great Wizard After what felt like an eternity, you made your escape from the chatty little wizard and found yourself wandering the corridors of the castle. The shattering array of directions to Dumbledore's classroom rang vaguely in your head. And so you strolled past, landmark after checkpoint, after alarming point of interest. For 15 minutes, you meandered past all sorts of strange and curious things. Moving staircases, levitating lanterns, suits of armour which seemed to move, plants which appeared to have more in common with a panther than a parsnip, heavy locked doors behind which Terrible noises of some snarling beasts bellowed. But then, eventually, you saw a door which matched the boy's description. At the far end of the corridor, lit with candles on either side, was a dark coloured wooden door with a purple crystal knocker. Upon closer inspection, of a placard beside the door were the delicately written words of Defence Against the Dark Arts Professor Dumbledore This was the place You breathed another big sigh feeling a little nervous. It felt like that was all you'd been doing since your arrival. You raised your hand, reaching out for the purple crystal knocker. Come in, my dear. A voice bellowed from behind the door, before you'd even laid a finger. The 
a little surprised, you retracted your hand and instead reached for the stout metal doorknob and pushed with a twist of the wrist. The door swung open, creaking as it did so. The room was dim, faintly lit here and there on bookshelves which brimmed with literature. There was that rich smell, similar to that of an old library. A blend of century-old parchment, leather and dust. Stepping inside the threshold, you became aware of a man standing at the far side of the classroom, beyond the ragged desks. He had his back turned to you, and was lit from the far side by a narrow band of natural light coming in from the single window. Airborne dust particles gave the light mass and texture. This single light source picked out a colourful robe, a mix of burgundies and mustards, with flashes of electric blue. He wore curly-toed brown shoes and grey pinstripe trousers. On the corner of his desk sat a hat that was rough around the edges, although it still resembled the crisp trilby it supposedly once was. The rabid pang of déjà vu rattled your conscience. It was deeply unsettling. Stepping shyly, but further into the room, you straightened your jacket and cleared your throat gently, afraid to break the peace and tension. You reached in and pulled out the soft, velvet cloth, unravelling the Philosopher's Stone in your hand. It was warm, warm from its long travels, never leaving your protection. Albus Dumbledore? You asked with a formal, slightly shaky inflection. A 
I do hope your travels were perfectly comfortable, my dear. The great wizard spoke softly, turning on a foot with the warmest of welcoming smiles. I have been expecting you 